Besides so for, web, for the web services space. And this, do we have sound? Okay. Um, which is W is addressing. SOAP envelopes are not messages. That's not one of my provocative pieces. It's just that's just that's just so, right? Um, I currently um, the project lead for um, a thing that we're building for um, a banking customer of ours, uh, and they have a they have a pretty ambitious big project um, that will run across five continents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and they need to integrate a bunch of very slow backend systems. So what, what we're doing is we're building them a caching infrastructure, um, which they can basically put between their web service proxies or any proxy, um, so they can uh, define policies. Um, and go and cache based on all sorts of different criteria and the caches will refresh themselves, etc. So there's a lot of stuff, stu stuff going on. Um, in that respect, and how do we store our cache entries? Well, our cache entries have a lot of metadata to them. Um, because we need to remember a lot of things about the acquisition of, the, of those data items. So we can, we can execute all of our retention policies on, on those items. And so I have I have raw data that I want to cache, and I have a lot of metadata that, that I need to remember alongside with it. And it turns out the SOAP envelope is a very good thing for that. So we're creating a SOAP envelope, we're creating a bunch of headers, uh, custom headers. Each of those headers is responsible for uh, one metadata element for our retention policy, and then we have a SOAP, the body, and that actually has our, our cache item. So we use the SOAP envelope not to send stuff around, but simply as, a, as an annotation mechanism. Right? And that's what it's for. You have metadata and you have, you have payloads, and you want to store those things together, you just wrap them up into one envelope and just store them somewhere. So we use SOAP envelope in this case as uh, a model to stuff into a database, or stuff into a file system, or stuff into memory, <coughs> depending on what our uh, cache storage provider needs. Uh, SOAP envelope is a general purpose infrastructure to store um, data alongside with metadata. And if I mean store, it could also be storing it on the wire, if you will, right? You store it on the wire for someone else until they fetch it or until they get it, if you, if you, if you would look at it that way. It's not a messaging standard at all. It's not a protocol, certainly not a protocol, right? It was, it was coined the simple object access protocol. And of course, it was never a protocol, right? It was always on the format. WC addressing turns so into a messaging system, into a messaging envelope, into a message. <coughs> so that's important. You will also see some interesting aspects that grow out of this. WC addressing has a little bit of a misleading name, just as WC reliable messaging has a somewhat misleading name. And, and actually, those two standards, and I was addressing, reflects another standard that you know very well. We'll see, we'll see how far we get. So, that was addressing, that was inventing two standards that I'm, that I'm going to mention explicitly. Basic considerations. You walk up to a web service, and all you have is a URL. Okay? Let's assume we have an HTTP web service. You have a URL, you walk up to the web service. What do you know about that web service? Nothing. You know where it is. But that's all. How would you know, how do you know all the other things? Well, you could try question mark WSDL on it. And if that doesn't give you any results, well, your, go your guess is as good as mine, you probably won't be talking to it. If you give someone just a web an HTTP address, they don't know what to do with it. So apparently passing that as a reference by itself is sufficient. Peer-to-peer -peer request response communication, peer-to-peer -peer meaning 
I see the server and I'm just asking it questions, request response. Um, that's a common web services way and that's what HTTP is good for, a simple URL, but it's certainly not sufficient. We need to have a way to pass references around to say, uh, here's a bit of data, please work on it and then come back to me. Uh, and then you need to be able need to be able to express the what is me. Right? Come back here. You need to tell the other side what here means. Right? You need to give them a reference to yourself. Notification and events are also necessary in some way, but what we have in object in object terms is like volatile callbacks. You have an object, <coughs> object lives, object registers with another object, as long as they live, they can talk, but what happens if one or the other service is restarted, dies, goes away, is relocated, etc., all of a sudden those, those simple events don't do it. Uh, they're not robust, so we need to have a different way. We need to have a way to register services more permanently, um, so we need to have a way to express pointers in a different way. So we need to have address expressions, we need to have pointers, we need to have all those things that we know from distributed systems. But we need to have them in slightly different ways, in more robust ways, in more interoperable ways. So, with that, next basic consideration, or statement, a message is an immutable, uniquely identifiable data container that serves to relay information for a specific purpose from the sender to a well-known recipient. That's my message definition. Which hopefully sounds a little reasonable. So, so mm, it's not set. It doesn't satisfy by itself. Doesn't satisfy those requirements because so has no sense of directionality. Right? So doesn't have any sense of direction. So we need to do that. I already, I already mentioned this uh, before by writing this little letter, right? Uh, or by just acting as if I would. The little, the little letter with uh, the envelope to, from, tracking number. So I can register it. If I register it with DHL, it gets a tracking number, unique, unique number. And as long as the envelope is closed, I can't modify the letter. Right? Letters don't modify themselves in transit. Same story here. WC addressing defines a message ID to allow unique identification of messages. WC addressing defines an action which allows you to express purpose of the message, intent with the message. From, this is like the subject line in the letter. From identifies who sent that message and two defines where that message is sent to. All of a sudden, with those four elements, we have messages. Where before, we only had envelopes. Identifier. Messages are immutable, meaning once the, at low, at low, as long as the envelope is closed, nobody can change it, and are uniquely identifiable. Reason for that being, I want to track the message. I want to track the message in diagnostics, for instance. I want to see where that message currently sticks. I want to see where that message went for diagnostics. Uh, I would probably need to um, correlate messages based on their ID, right? I'm sending a message into a TCP pipe, and then I'm waiting until I'm waiting for messages to come back, and I want to catch the exact message that's the response for my message. How do I do this? Well, I need to have some tracking device. I need to have some some device which allows me to do that correlation very easily. And a message ID is is, is something like this. So WSA message ID defines the message relates to specifies the relationship to message ID. Sender identifies that the sender recipient is to where that's sent to and uh, the action specifies the sender idea. Let's go into a little more detail. Here's W's A2. Sorry for the angle brackets, um, but that's, that's the, that's the, 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 that happens to be the standard. Those same elements are also exposed on WS, on WC, the web service enhancements, 
um, in uh, the in the message in the soap context, and uh, also in Indigo on the headers collection. So they're very important. They are the most important properties they, which exist in the web services soap web web services field. Right? They're so important that they have been specifically exposed. Two. The two field is mandatory, must be used if you use addressing, and that indicates who that message is directed to. Without two, no message. Identifies the message recipient endpoint. Now, that may be a logical address or a network address. The address I'm showing here is not a network address. It can't be valid because tempuri.org is registered by uh, someone. Actually, it's registered by Microsoft, but it doesn't matter. And there can't be any valid endpoints behind tempuri.org. Right? So if I would say www.intelligence.com slash svc slash endpoint, there could be an endpoint, there could be something you could talk to, but there could also be a logical address. The, the fun thing in XML land is that Many things that start with HTTP slash slash schemas dot something like dot com aren't meant to be HTTP endpoints that you can do something with. They're merely used to make sure that this identifier is unique because I can do with my domain whatever I want. If this is a, if this is a physical address, I could probably send messages to it. If this is not a logical address, then I have to then I can route on it. Let's assume for a moment this is just a physical address. It makes things a lot easier, right? So this is the place that I'm posting messages to. I'm going to get back to the logical address. Keep in mind, it may be a logical address. Same thing applies to from. This is the sender. That's an optional element. Just as much as the, the postal service will deliver a letter which has no sender on the envelope, um, SOAP infrastructures typically will also send messages that have no from, because it's not strictly necessary to have a from. Like when you do HTTP, it's implied who the from is. Right? It's the guy at the other side of the socket. Uh, if you do HTTP, it's also sort of implied what the two is, almost, because you can still be targeting, you just opening port 80, you need to find one of those endpoints listening in HTTP space. Uh, in the URI space of that server. So you have to have some indicator of what we are talking to. So it identifies the message sender. That may be a logical network address. And if that's not callable, then it's simply optional or the so-called anonymous sender. There is a action identifies the purpose of the call, uh, identifies the purpose of the message. This, this field is typically used to figure out the operation which you want to evoke on the server side when you send this message. It is, it is used to identify what type of message that is, uh, what the operation is. In the bindings that you have, um, in the whistle bindings, the whistle bindings are typically taking an operation, associating them with an action, right? Um, when they're bound. So when they're, when they're being bound to transport. And that is the exact action. This is equivalent to the SOAP action HTTP header as defined in SOAP 1.1 and to the action content type parameter as defined in SOAP 1.2. Asynchronous pro uh, reply correlation, message ID. Message ID is a UUID or any other URI. UUID is the easiest one because you need to get generate a lot of those and they have to be unique for every message. Um, and you have a relates to field. The relates to field contains the same value as the incoming message ID if you want to correlate messages. So the response, this is a request and the response to that request contains the same uh, UUID or the same URI would be precise as the incoming message ID. And every message, whether it's a request or response, always has its own message ID. So message ID identifies the message uniquely, 
Typically, it's using the UUID protocol. Um, but for the web services world, this is just a string. Right? The UUID is used as a convenience to make sure that this number is really unique. But for web services, this is just a URL. It's just a string. It just has to be unique. And you do a string comparison of those things. Must be present in each message using WC addressing to uniquely identify the message. Related to that is the relates to header, which contains the number of the message ID of the message you're relating to. Relates to has a standard meaning, a default meaning of reply. If you have any other correlation uh, basis that you can find, it's hard to find one, but if you have one, um, then you can specify special attributes that's defined alongside with relates to that uh, uh, lets you specify the relationship between the message and the related, the, the related message and the original message. So, it, and that's very that's for simple for simple correlation. Only this message ID relates to makes it really possible to use um, web services those web service web service protocols, the envelopes, with TCP, right? TCP is a streaming protocol, uh, which can easily be framed. The frame would be uh, a length indicator, followed by a SOAP envelope, followed by the next end length indicator. So it's just a frame, simple thing, frame <coughs> protocol. But <coughs> sockets are bidirectional, and there's no notion of regressive response, right? You just throw stuff in one direction, and there's stuff coming in the other direction uh, in parallel. So, if you want to correlate, you can pump messages down the pipe, and on the other side, they come pet messages down the pipe as well. So you need to catch the, pet, the matching message. To catch a matching message, you need to have some, some keys, some information to have that, and that's what relates to this form. These were the headers that turn SOAP into messages. It's pretty simple. There's, there's a little more to that. We need to introduce another concept first. It's the EPR. That's one of those new three-letter abbreviations, the so-called TLAs, right? TLA stands for three-letter abbreviation. <laughs> or a three-letter acronym, depending on who you ask. So the new TLA for pointer is for the EPR. The EPR endpoint reference is four things. The contract reference, it's an XML thing. The contract reference containing a port type reference and a service name reference. This is referencing pieces in WSDL. Actually, it's, it's identifying, it's reference ident referencing identifiers in WSDL. This element assumes that you already have a bunch of whistles in your hand, that you already have pre-generated proxies, that you know what you're dealing with. This port type and service name let you pick from your cache of service contracts the one that this that this service here that's described by the endpoint reference is using. It assumes that you already know all whistles in the call. It's 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 so okay. Next thing is policy reference. Uh, this is an element that is in the specification, which you should simply ignore. Right? It's in the specification. It was a mistake to put it into the, into the, into the specification. Uh, it was too late to take it out. Right? Everybody, everybody started implementing this, and, and everybody at IBM and BA and Microsoft came to the same conclusion and said, uh, and what are we supposed to do with that? <coughs> so it turns out nobody's using it, right? This was meant to be the reference to the policy of that respective endpoint. The problem is no one end, no endpoint has one policy, but actually each operation has its own policy. So it's 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 hanging the policy element sort of on the same on the wrong thing, and that's why it's a questionable <coughs> element. So. I haven't seen that in the wild yet. 
there's the location reference. This is your URL. And then there's an instance reference with reference properties and reference parameters. And those reference properties and reference parameters allow you to set cookies on your co at your communication part, uh, uh, with your communication party. It's a cookie mechanism. It's the easiest way to explain it. Um, let me explain that to you in a few better terms and that comes here, in reference passing. Is that true? Client, service, most other service. Let's, so this would be a, um, a broker. A broker sits there and uh, is maybe load balancing or doing you know, whatever the broker needs to do. So this service knows another service and it wants, to, it wants us to use the other service but we don't know about, this, about it yet. So the client walks up to the service and says, hello. And the server says, cool, good to see you. Next time you, next time you come back, don't talk to me, talk to someone else. So client comes and does a, re oops, does a request. Mm. Let's see. So client comes, do, do, does a request. The server passes this EPR, this reference, back to the client, and with that, the client now has enough metadata to actually bind to the other party. It has port type or service name, which means it can identify the exact contract that's being used. It has a URL, which it can bind to, which it probably can use, which is probably also a metadata exchange URL, because that's the trick. The EPRs, as they will emerge. Currently, that's a field that's you know before Indigo comes out or before any of the advanced web services infrastructures come come out, which have the complete stack. This is a field where everybody does, does their own thing. The practical use of this would be: you send an EPR. The EPR contains the address is your MEX endpoint, your message metadata exchange endpoint. Your port type element will indicate that that is a metadata exchange endpoint, right? So that's something that's easily recognizable. And then you will walk out, you will walk up to the other service and say, give me contract, give me your message contract, give me policy. Right? I can configure myself to actually bind to that service and can talk, start talking to it. That's the practical use of it. Until then, the addresses typically identify the, directly the message endpoint and, and make some assumptions that you know how to talk to it. But it's your managed pointer implementation, or that you simply know how to talk to that particular type of endpoint. Here's our reference parameters. Reply to is an instance of, is a type of an endpoint reference. It's a special header that allows, to, allows us to do a little more complicated correlation than we are able to do with the simple uh, message ID and uh, relates to pattern. Reply to, you can send to any endpoint. This works with, with uh, the web service enhancements today. So you talk to, you talk to an endpoint, let's say HTTP, <coughs> and you say, you add a reply to header. And you say, you know what, any replies you send, don't send them to me, send them somewhere else. What WYSI does, what the web service enhancements do, is they follow this rule. So you can make a request, a web service request today, to uh, a WYSI web service, and you, you add this reply to it. If the WYSI web service will come back to you with a 200 OK and not give you anything. Instead, it will turn around and create a proxy on the fly and send its reply to the address you indicate. It'll turn around, it'll turn automatically into a client and open a connection to deliver the result if you indicate reply to. So you can, you can just like with email where you can say reply to address is this, you can redirect the place where you want to have, where you want to reply to, uh, uh, to end up. This could also include a protocol change, right? So you could say, I'm asking you a question in, in TCP, but I want you to come back to me in, in HTTP or the other way around. WYSI is capable of doing that. Indigo is going to be capable of doing that as well. 
if you now have um, give a long running operation and you're doing this out, out of a workflow. So if a workflow, workflow running at the client, it's a workflow engine, maybe. So, and that has a workflow running. Work, the workflow is a workflow that takes 30 years to complete. Right? Typical mortgage workflow. It takes 30 years to complete. At least in Germany, maybe your houses are cheaper. Or more expensive. And your mortgages take 60 years to complete out. So I'm sending the occasional message. Right? The message takes a day to answer to. So I'm sending a message. And now when this comes back, when the, when the reply comes, there's no instance to talk to. <coughs> there's no object to talk to. So I need to wake up this, this workflow and dispatch the message on it. This is what the reference parameters are. I say, reply to the following address and the, take the following reference parameters. That's my cookie. The responding party is now obliged to take whatever stands in the reference parameter, literally, and copy that as headers into the outgoing message. Which means that on my endpoint where I am, I'll see those customer headers and I can say, all right, let's wake up this workflow and then dispatch a message on it. It's a cookie mechanism. That's what the reference parameters and reference properties are. Okay. So this was, I'm, I'm getting quicker and quicker with this talk. See, this, start, this, this started with being a 90-minute thing, right? And I'm, I'm worried if, if I don't do any uh, entertainment in between, I'm going to be so quick that you'll all be, I didn't get my money's worth, and all that. <laughs> so, up until here, it was a somewhat meaningful discussion of capabilities of an XML document format, right? Reply to is somewhat interesting. The kicker comes now. Client speaks to service, but service is not visible. Service sits behind firewall. That's a problem. Now we come to rally. Because we may have services that we need to talk to which we can't see. So, client throws message at gateway. Gateway takes message. See, the two, the two field in the, in the message now contains not the name of the gateway, not the address of the gateway. It contains the address of the service I want to target. Which means that for this link, Apparently, the two address was meaningless, right? Whether that was HTTP or anything else, it doesn't matter because that's not what we're using. The gateway now needs to know what to do with the message. So it looks up in its local routing table. It says, oh, if the URL in the to field is this, then we're throwing the message to this EPR. Otherwise, we're throwing it to this APR. Mind that this service or the other service could be gateways themselves. <coughs> that you could be matching a, a URI, you could be matching a URI prefix, you could be matching a URI regex pattern of all sorts of shapes, right? You have a routing table. Based on the routing table, you have an EPR in which direction you actually send, throw the stuff, and from there, that may be a different gateway or that may be actually the target service. Once you send that back, once you send the message through, of course, it sends a reply to with it. So if the other service can see you, it may be able to dispatch the message to the response to you directly. But it will be more likely that also that service has a local gateway. It will dispatch 
every message that it gets to the local gateway and let the local gateway figure out how those things work. Has anybody ever seen something like this? Message brokering. It's very much Way too complicated. You have the via header in the HTTP protocol. Uh, we're getting there. Still too complicated. Well, it's something in HTTP caches. Ah, uh, way too complicated. Firewalls and routers. Routers. <laughs> ah, 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 what's the protocol? TCP. TCP. Uh, uh. Ah, oh, RIP. IP. IP. This is IP. This is IP protocol. This is nothing more than the reformulation of the IP protocol in in in. In XML. This is the exact purpose of WC dressing. Nothing more, nothing less. <coughs> it's the IP protocol, it's not TCP. WC reliable messaging is identical to, to TCP. <coughs> That's why, why it's twice? such a bad name. Well, why do we need it twice? That's a very good question. That's good feedback. <laughs> Whenever a Microsoft, shh, that's, that's, here's a secret, okay? Whenever a Microsoft person says to you, hey, that's good feedback, the translation for that is, go away, don't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for destroying or making your life harder here, but that's how I am. That's all I can see. In, in a sense, I'm also making my own life harder. Uh, no, this thing is falling apart. Is it? Are we going to survive? Uh, maybe. Okay. So, the routing table. Okay. The routing table is just like the IP routing table. Why do we need those things twice? Because messages may rest on disk for a while. As soon as you put sword forward into the picture, that works, IP doesn't. Because IP is a volatile thing. IP works with things like DHCP. <coughs> IP is dramatically broken because we need stuff like NAT and all those ugly things. And because of NAT, because of that and because of NAT, IP is, is, is just, it's just, bad, it's just bad stuff, right? IPv4 is incredibly <coughs> limited because of the way the internet has formed and has shaped. IPv6, which is like, um, what's the other thing? Uh, oh, Duke and Nuke forever. <laughs> <laughs> I read too much flesh talk. Um, so New Duke and Nuke forever and IPv6, when they appear on the market for in earnest, right, at the same day, sometime in 2021, um, that will solve the problem. That might solve the problem. But then again, you still have the, the issue that you need to store messages on disk. And IP addresses are meaningless uh, if you store messages on disk, because as you resurrect the message, and the message may sit on disk for a while, right? A week, all depending on the application you want to write. A message may sit a week in a queue because it, it's not worth processing it yet. It just has so low, low priority because the thing that's, that's going to be triggered only matters in a year. And those things happen. There's systems with a lot of patience. And you resurrect it and all of a sudden that server whose IP address you have is gone, right? Has been sold, has been merged. Belongs to the other uh, to the other bank of which all people have been fired now. Bad corporate world. <laughs> so this uh, so this is essentially IP. It is it is fathomable. It's actually you can realize it today that for every web service call, for every application that you have, every message that leaves your network perimeter. Let's, let's call this your subnet, okay? For every message that leaves your subnet, you're actually throwing this message into a router or an array of routers that can deal with soap messages, 
sent through HTTP, IP, uh, IP, name pipes, and all sorts of different protocols. They look at the two header and have a routing table and they know what to send this stuff. And there's public routers, which actually can also forward those things. We have a complete virtualization of the network, which works with queues, with, which works with all those things. That is fathomable. I predict that's going to happen. I predict that within a year, we're going to see somewhere an ISP having a public uh, web services router out there. And if I make that happen, oh, only you should, you should, you can, you can smile, you can laugh. But there's a plan. <laughs> You'll know half the truth. I may get, I may, I may gain interesting powers in the next. Well, we'll see. Reply to, fall to. I already explained the reply to. Our EPRs, our endpoint references. Reply to indicates the endpoint to respond to, respond to, and must be followed. If you find. If the infrastructure finds a reply to, it must send any replies to that place, uh, and not to the assumed place. Fault to is an optional element which you, which allows you to specify the place to fault to. It's possible to to set exceptions this way, and to send answers this way. Why would would you want to do that? Well, it could be that you have have a call a virtual call site across the network, right? A, B, C, D, E. <coughs> E faults. If E faults, it may not be necessary to inform D, C, B, and A, but actually you could actually fault you can fault straight to A, and then you know everybody else is just leaving their stuff, and and they're happy. So you don't have to come back because there's no worth in, in continuing. So you can implement a fail fast mechanism using uh, fault. That's addressing. The addressing is IP. It's got all the elements, and that's why it's so important. That's why, why you need to use it. Eventing. Eventing is, eventing is one of those things that I get asked most about web services, except the should I send the data set. <laughs> and the interesting, well, the interesting thing about eventing is, when I say, this is how it works, people say, oh, that's interesting, thank you. <laughs> when, when people ask me about the data set and I say exactly what they don't expect, they start arguing with me. <laughs> right? that's, that's, a, that's the difference. You should believe me as much about the data set as you do about notifications and addressing all those things. I just know better. <laughs> right? Just accept it. Makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> Am I necessarily right? No. So, eventing. Eventing is, now, now that we have addressing, now we have an interesting mechanism to actually send events. Because it's very easy, right? I can go and um, say, I want to know when, oh, we do it. Ah, see, we do it in a different way. I have, I have ideas. I'm a creative guy. Look, I can say, if you, learn, if you learn something new about this thing, right, about whatever, I can say, give me a call. There you go. There she has an input reference. <laughs> now she has an endpoint reference, and now she can give me a call. She's got, she's got, she's got the entire contact information. And that's what an EPR is for. Now she can raise events to me and say, "I didn't quite understand what you said in this last talk on uh, uh, on the first day. So can you explain it all to me again?" And I'll say. No, no, no. There's a bu there's a bunch of addressing information on there. She can write me she can write me postal mail, all all of the, all of those things, right? So there's 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 
That's network marketing. That's what we have now, right? We have we have business cards, so to speak, with the EPRs. That's what they are. They're persistable, persistable, like the business card, persistable things that remain that remain valid for a longer time. So having that, we can send events and notifications. What is an event? An event is just a message. Typically or often it's broadcast, right? But we need to deliver events and notifications. Now, there's a, slight, there's a slight issue with events when we talk about web services. A tiny, tiny, tiny little thing. So let's talk about the... Uh, I think the thing is now falling apart from the hood. There comes that now. <laughs>
because because in this in this field people are still looking right for the perfect solution that doesn't include polling. The bad news is there's none. I'm very sorry. There is polling. Uh, unless you find some magic, we'll have to use one or the other. So. Uh, our firewall can't penetrate it. That's what it's for. Network, network address translation uh, worsens the problem. Um, and online and offline, I don't even have need, to, need to discuss. Let's look at the problem. Problem is right here. So any attempt to connect from the server to the client is futile. Right? There's no, there's no need to even try this. There's no need to even consider this if you are in an environment where you need to talk to clients, client machines. If you're talking in a server farm, all hunky-dory works wonderfully. It's great. Once clients are in the picture, badness. So, how do you fix this? It's two ways. I'm very proud of my PowerPoints, I have to say. <laughs> I think I should be MVP for PowerPoint, <laughs> not for architecture, because I think my PowerPoints are a lot better than my architecture. That's how good they are. Actually, actually, seeing that, there's a slide that I skipped in my first talk, which I still have to show you. Not that it would actually enhance this presentation, but I still have time. <coughs> And I'm so proud of this particular slide that I have to show it to you. You will go, you will go home and buy PowerPoint just for that slide. <laughs> from your private pocket. Look. What that slide means doesn't matter. Look at the effect. <laughs> My, this is not flash, right? <laughs> I think that's just complete coolness. <laughs> <laughs> it is, see, the thing is very, it's very simple. There's, there's, there's a bunch of animation things in PowerPoint, and you just need to know how to use it right. So here is polling. Um, I'm going to restart this. The, the event source keeps sending events. And luckily, the client comes and pick, it picks up events, right? So there's a few events queuing up here in the store, and the client comes and picks those things up, and keeps picking them up, and keeps picking them up. In this case, everything is fine. Now, the event source falls silent, because simply it doesn't have anything to do anymore. Since the client doesn't know about this, it nervously keeps picking up events, causing traffic that's unnecessary. That's what people are scared of. Now, what can you do? You can say, okay, I poll only every 60 seconds. Which is, of course, cat catastrophic if you need to have the events in any timely fashion. So basically, as if you need to have the resolution of your, of your events, or the timeliness of your events, must be as accurate as you can, probably in, in the second or sub-second order. Now, this means you have to poll every second, which of course is bad. This is why people hate polling, and I completely understand it. Do we want to use polling in this naive, dangerous, horrible form? No. But it's one of the base elements of something that makes more sense. The other element is persistent connections. The client, who's the only one who can penetrate that firewall, creates a TCP socket and opens it. Once that TCP socket is open, the server can talk as much as it wants to the client. Right? It needs to maintain the socket, but now it has an open pipe that can simply throw any sort of data at any time at it. The disadvantage is you need a lot of sockets. Right? First. Second, you can't really use the convenient HTTP infrastructure 
and you may get filtered out. So the, the firewall may still catch you. Because you're using a non-standard protocol, blah, 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 may not conform, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's the best thing. There's a lot of infrastructures using that. Uh, I'm getting to those in a little while. There's a wonderful strategy that combines the two. This is called part calls. Part calls makes persistent connections using polling. The trick is very simple. You park a call at the server. You make a web service call. You need to do a little tuning of your HTTP stack, meaning IIS in, in the Windows case, and your web services stack in terms of timeouts. Right? You, need to, you need to tweak the registry to allow more open sockets, probably. But these are things which are manageable. Right? And you, you make a call. If the subscription manager has in its local events queue for that particular client, no event available, it hangs that thread. It will simply say, sleep, or join, or wait on, wait on, a, wait on a wait handle. It's simply gonna, gonna freeze that thread, which is gonna force that socket to, slip, to stay open. So now we've created a persistent connection by just catching a, uh, a client call. And now we sit there and wait. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and if no messages have, have arrived, we return the call, we unblock, to return the call so that the client knows we're still alive, right? Everything is, is okay. The client's obligation is to come immediately back with another call. That also is going to be called. As soon as we have an event, as soon as we have one, we return that call and deliver the event, or two or three events in a batch format. So what, what we have is we have the responsiveness of part calls together with the HTTP, HTTP features of um, the polling of the polling thing. So that's a reasonable combination of, of part calls together with, um, with uh, uh, it's a reasonable combination of polling together with persistent connections. Right? Part calls. Part calls is a very cool trick. And it's not mine. You still have the socket open uh, all the time. You still have the socket. Yes, you need to manage. You need. To, you need to expand the number of sockets available. You probably have to cluster that machine. Okay. okay. That's How about using the uh, first reply and then second, sending a second, a third reply, a continuous HTTP session? Um, in that case, if I would, if I, would, I would would, not if you have server. multiple, you mean if you have multiple events sitting there? No, not in case of multiple events. Let's say you do the first send, you send an initial reply that says, I'll send you a reply. And then in the 20 seconds, if I'll get the, the event, I'll send him the second reply. Uh, yeah, the, the problem is you can't, you can rely on both, both parties holding the connection open between request and response. However, you cannot rely, as per RFC 2616, you cannot uh, rely on Keep Alive. Yeah, but you can use streaming data because HTTP does stream, sends more than one. Yeah, but again, it's, that's, that's interoperation, interoperating to the spec versus practical. Okay. Right? In practice, everybody's going to ignore whatever you sent after the first one. But whatever the spec says is not is nice, right? But whatever people actually do is a wholly different story. Your ASP.NET web client proxy will simply ignore whatever you send in addition to it. And so will your JAX proxy and, and everything else. You can you can sit there down at the protocol level and say, hey, don't ignore me, but nobody's going to listen to you. Actually, Jack, most JAX RPC will, will wait for the second call as well. Fine. Okay. You're using the superior technology. Not saying that. It's just interesting. It would be interesting for me to see the programming model for that. You make, I make a call and I get a response. Where does the second response go? 
I say I'm going to send a second response. Let's say you're working with HTTP 1.1 as you mentioned in your yeah, yeah, but then you're not then you're not using a programming model. You're just using you're just pulling raw messages out of out, out of out of the queue. You okay? For you, it's fine. For the rest of the for, for most no, of the people in the room, I, it's probably not. I'm still saying that most people do use streaming HTTP, and that is okay. However, it, they may be dry. There may be dry periods when there is no events. Yes. Yeah. And again, you would be using you. You're extending the the model of persistent sockets. But but in, in, what you're actually doing is you're abusing HTTP as a TCP framing protocol. Okay. Okay. So next problem: servers behind firewall. Now, I mean, until now we thought we had issues, right? Now we have an issue because. Now both communication paths are blocked. What are we going to do now? Uh, no, 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 no. MSMQ, see, MSMQ over HTTP doesn't work either because we don't, we don't really have. Ah. See, here's here's the MSMQ man. Almost. What you need in that case is you need to have a friend in public IP space. <laughs> we have friends in public IP space. Right? This is only half joking. Messenger, Skype, SIP, Jabber, so SIP just as a protocol moniker, but really Messenger and Jabber, Jabber standing for Google Talk, right? Are great infrastructures to do routing. Well, they route chatting text, right? Turns out, text is text. So, in my rare spare time, I've written, just you know, to figure it out, uh, a little WYSI transport that's abusing the MSN Messenger protocol. So I can actually route SOAP messages through MSN Messenger, have two applications chat to each other in SOAP, right? And it works great. So my next endeavor is going to be to abuse, just as, as a form of public punishment, to, to, write, to write an Indigo channel that communicates through Google Talk <laughs> and make that available to the general public. Then we're going to see what Google says to that. Um, because everybody has, an ad everybody has an address, right? You can register your address. You can plug that into your protocol stack. You have a friend in public IP space. Well, probably not exactly friend, but sort of. Right? You have a friend in public IP space, and they're going to bridge the firewalls for you. Because this guy is going to put, peek out and have a persistent connection. You only do your, your protocol stuff with your local guy. But really, the protocol is handled by the <coughs> channel or by WYSI channel. Same thing is happening here, and you have two TCP channels which are managed through the switchboard of Jabber. If you, <coughs> okay, now we're talking enterprise ready, right? You don't want to route your enterprise through Jabber, of course. But the same thing is true for a public IP SOAP router. That's the exact thing that I said, said about the gateway. That's the idea. You have in public IP space, you have a thing that can route using the WIS addressing, can route messages. And all of a sudden, with this, with this message brokering hub out there in space, you'll have a way to bridge the, those gateways. And if that thing speaks IP, means TCP channels, uh, we'll, all be, we'll all be fine. And my prediction is that that's a service that would be great if you're if you happen to be an ISV or a telecommunication company. That's an interesting niche to open. Um, I would I would be thinking because that is solving a lot of people's problems. Because that's one of the questions I always get, and it's how do I do events? How do I do callbacks? Well, that's the way how you do callbacks. <coughs> Remoting. And RMI and enterprise service and all those technologies are okay for delivering events on the local machine, probably inside the lab. But for white area networks, nobody has an answer. 
We need to have an explicit infrastructure. WC addressing helps there, but that's this is the stuff. This is the stuff that we need to do. We need to have friends in public IP space, and eventually there's going to be public public router infrastructure that helps with those situations. WC venting, WC addressing, all the specifications are there, and there's no barrier to adoption in terms of what the technology, it, it, as far as the technology is concerned. Even security works in those types of scenarios because there's in message security. Right? You can secure content and still be routed by a public infrastructure. And you can do multiple credentials. So assume you would make you make you would be an operator and you would make such a thing available. Each message can contain a header, a security, an authentication header, which is targeted at the intermediary. So the intermediary gets an authentication packet, knows you are you are one of the paying customers, takes the message throws it into a different bucket, and that's, that contains the authentication header to authenticate at the target service. You can have multiple credentials layered into a SOAP message, so it's not a problem. And even if you have multiple of those, you could still target them right. The infrastructure, the, the definition, the whole technology is in place to do that. We just don't have implementation yet, but this is, this is where I see things going. And that's what we have. So eventing is, is fixed as per spec. Um, addressing is fixed and implemented uh, for a long time already. Three years, maybe, uh, through WS addressing. And of course, in all routing, security is important. All messages that you expose to any sort of gateway or routers could be tampered with. So messages should always be signed and better encrypted. So that it's clear that the message cannot be tampered. Um, you have to, if you encrypt the message, you don't have to worry about the wire transport encryption. Um, you can always use HTTPS, which is always, if people ask me, what, are, what, are, what am I going to use for SOAP in terms of security? The easiest option is a remains HTTPS. Right? Um, but if you put routing into the picture, then you need to have end-to-end -end security as independent of how many hops you have. Uh, messages need to be secured on disk because they may end up on someone else's disk. So you need to control, and if you want to control you, the security of your messages, you better encrypt the messages themselves, the message contents themselves, instead of relying on something like HTTPS um, or any other transport-based security. The transport can be as insecure as you like um, if the message is secure in and by itself and encryption and uh, signature um, that I'm going to talk about in more detail tomorrow are going to guarantee that. So, those addressing is about location and metadata. It's re about reply and routing paths. It's your, it's your equivalent of the internet protocol, of IP, of sending packets around the network. WC Venting is a published subscribed framework that works in cooperation with W with WC addressing. And keep in mind that um, there's a little trickery no, uh, needed to deal with the gateways to uh, sorry, to deal with NAT and firewalls. But these are all things that are solvable, polling and and all those other strategies. So so much on that topic. With that. Damn, I've been doing good on time. Um, and Achim has been doing, doing good on time too, which is a first for him because he always runs over uh, badly. Like, you know, he's not here, so, oh, he's in the back. Yeah, he typically is like 20 minutes overtime. He typically have to come in and have to drag him off stage. And then he says, oh, no, 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 I only have two minutes left. And then 20 minutes later when I come, you know how that goes. That was the first day. Um, tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, service patterns, about transactions, about security. Uh, and then I'm going to show you um, a bunch of code. I have been uh, showing um, a um, somewhat still, it's a political, it's a politically challenged little application that we wrote. Uh, so Microsoft and Redmond 
doesn't really want this application to be widely published, so we keep giving it to customers. <laughs> in cooperation with our, our friends in my, around Microsoft and Mia. Uh, we're currently upgrading this application, which turns out to be not as easy because the application is pretty big. Um, and so we want to do it all with uh, lessons learned from the last two years, which requires a really little rework. And we're doing it on the brand new Tula, uh, .NET 2 framework. So tomorrow we're going to show you that app, uh, but we're not going to give you that app. Oh. <laughs> Um, we're going to try to find a way to make it available um, within the next two months. Okay, I'm not making any promises because it's a politically interesting situation around that app. Um, eventually, that app is going to serve. What you can, what I'll, what I'll do is I'm going to write a little sort of template of how those services in that app are structured. Um, and I'm actually going to abuse the session that we're going to have with the architect uh, user group a little later uh, tonight. I'm going to abuse that session to actually build that template. And uh, you're going to get that template uh, then to through your uh, Microsoft Israel channel or if you bring a memory stick uh, tomorrow. Right. Um, then you can get one of the slide decks right away on your memory stick. So, with that, I wish all of you who are not staying for the for the architect event, uh, for the user group event, you're all architects. Uh, great evening, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.